one of the things we came out of that understanding is making sure that you have people who are sold into your vision, right, of moving the country forward, not people who loan you money such that when you get there, you become indebted to them. And that starts, that repeats a cycle of embezzlement, you know, that affects the welfare of the people. Welcome to The Conversation. I'm your host, Ismail Akwe, and today we are discussing the leadership gap in Africa and the role of the youth in filling this gap at the top if the laws allow them. Our guest for this discussion is Chiki Ukaigu, an educator, entrepreneur, investor, humanitarian, biomedical engineer, and Nigeria's youngest presidential candidate who joined the 2019 presidential race at just 35 years old. Welcome, Chike, to the conversation. Thank you, Ismail. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. You were brave in 2018 when you decided to run for president just after Muhammadu Buhari passed the bill that reduced the age limit for presidential aspirants from 40 to 35. Were there any major losses besides getting a little over 8,900 votes for your party, the Advanced Allied Party? So were there any major losses? Yeah. Um, hmm. That's a great question, right? Um, it's, of course, what you consider a loss. And if you did not win, then yes, you know, every other person who participated in a loss. However, though, um, for me, um, there were so many lessons learned um, that I will not necessarily consider it a loss. I learned a lot about, about the country, um, about the state of affairs with the people, uh, which is very important to me. <clears throat> and of course, uh, it was also important to show that it could be done uh, once you have the uh, you have the right ideology, you have the right passion, um, and with empathy, um, you know it it could be done. Um, Africa is the most youthful continent today, um, but we have. Um, I don't know if I'll be wrong to say we have some of the oldest leaders in the world. Um, so it's important that, you know, we as the younger, the next generation, you know, starts to step into leadership positions. Um, and every step that is taken towards achieving that, I consider success. So, yeah. Hmm. In the latest election in Nigeria, we didn't see you there. The election that brought to power Bola Tinubu. Well, okay, so for, for different reasons. Uh, so I, I played a part, but behind the scenes, and I had to do that because of my work, right? Um, I cannot be political <laughs> um, okay. because, you know, my employer um, works in, in, in the country, right? Uh, but behind the scenes, you know, we were still able to uh, help where we could, um, push, you know, ideologies, um, mobilize and organize young people to try to encourage them to participate and all that. So I did play my part. It was just not in the press like it was in 2019. Yeah. But putting your work aside, if let's say it wasn't there, could you have had that financial muscle to go through this election? Because a lot of money was moving around. Were you really uh, prepared or could you have done it? Um. Hmm. So yes, money is, uh, is an extremely important uh parts of our elections, uh, of elections, period, anywhere, but particularly uh, in Nigeria, right? Um, now, would I have done it again if I weren't at my job? No, because I thought P2B was credible. Um, she had the same ideologies um, and had definitely more political experience than I did, right? It would just... It would become, at that point, it would become a uh, selfish ambition um, going into try to do it again if, if a credible candidate was there. So I um, it was important for me to find the right person who had the ability, uh, the financial prowess, and, um, you know, the empathy uh, that Nigeria and Africa needs, basically, and throw all of my support behind them. And that was what I did. Okay. And that means you supported Peter Obi and you campaigned for him for this election. 
I supported his ideology, right? Okay. Um, I, as, like I said, because of my position at work, I couldn't publicly campaign for anyone. Um, but it was important for me to voice what I believed was right for the country um, and to encourage or empower people um, who were either disenfranchised or were not sure. Um, and looking at, you know, the ideologies, the, ex the, the past experiences, um, and credibility of the candidates, he seemed the best person. And yes, I, I spoke up about it. Well, during your time, you campaigned on three pillars, which are technology, education, and entrepreneurship to build Nigeria. Are they still relevant today, looking at the changing times? Extremely, extremely, right? So part of the reason why, you know, I came out in 2019, um, I don't know if you know this about me, but I actually launched the first um, diversity-focused tech accelerator in New York, in New York State, uh, maybe even in the country. Um, and usually when we had applicants, what we realized was, you know, um, Africa was quite behind and the uh, the threat of automation, you know, what we call the fourth industrial revolution, um, ravaging our continent, uh, made it pertinent that we had credible leaders who did not just understand uh, current problems, but can also look out into the future and come up with solutions that can prepare us for the future. Um, and for me, like I said, those three things were extremely crucial and still are. Education uh, helps us to understand our problems, but also to come up with solutions to them. Technology helps us scale out these solutions and entrepreneurship helps us to market them. I feel like I'm running for a campaign again. I don't want to do that, right? But, you know, also having a very youthful populace, right? Um, our young people are very adept when it comes to social media, right? So the the growing uh, digitization of the continent, the growing uh, penetration of smartphones, right? It's, it's creating opportunities that we once did not have. Um, and uh, tapping into, into but the appetite, the hunger, the ability of our young people and empowering them, um, I think is, is definitely something the continent still needs, but a place like Nigeria extremely um, is in dire need of. So yes, those three pillars, I would say are still extremely important to the progress um, of our nation and of the continent. Yeah, and you keep referring to the young people, bringing the young people up so they could be part of the decision-making and also leadership. However, you were quite lucky, I would say, to be able to vie for presidency at 35. Right now, I'm sure a lot of the young leaders we have may not be able to push through when it comes to any of such leadership roles. Do you think there should be more done to allow younger people to be able to join in such, uh, I mean, race and such ambitions of becoming leaders like presidents in African countries? Um, well, of course, the, the apparent answer to that is yes. But let me be clear, when I talk about young people, right, um, not just any young, we need credible mm -hmm. young people. Uh, that's extremely important. No. Uh, because you could have young leaders with the same mindset of um, rulers that have derailed the future of the continent and will will be in more trouble, right? Just like you have, you know, older people who are still in touch, but with empathy and the right leadership skills uh, to lead the continent, right? Um, however, yes, we need to do a lot more uh, to empower younger you know, the younger generation or the next generation. And when I say young, I mean, I'm 40 now. Um, so in politics, you know, 40 could still be young. But in reality, we have people who are, you know, Gen Zs and younger um, who are also upcoming. So as we clamor and fight for the, the voice of the young person to be ha heard, it's important for our generation to understand that there are also people behind us and start now to groom them for that. One of the things I talked about uh, in terms of failure or our failure to incorporate young um, um, young minds in decision-making is the fact that 
you know, the older generation did not have a transition uh, mechanism, right, or system to groom people who are credible and capable of leadership, right? Now, since we have been able to identify that problem, it is important that we don't pass on that problem to the next generation, right? So um, as we clamor for, excuse me, uh, the involvement of more young people in politics is also important that we start now to raise and groom um, the next generation uh, so that even if we don't get there, we have people behind who are qualified and credible enough to step into those positions and succeed. You represent uh, diaspora Nigerians and you see things from New York where you're based. What do you see as the current problems in Nigeria? Because the current president says, well, he has a plan and things will change. But a lot of people do not believe that there will be any change. And already there are complaints about expenditure. There was a complaint about a presidential uh, yacht, which uh, is, I mean, it costs a lot of money while a lot of Nigerians are having health crisis. What do you see as the main problems right now in Nigeria? Uh, it's a lack of a vision. Right. Um, and it's not just in Nigeria. Right. If you look at some of the African countries, in my opinion, that are doing well or that are beginning to strive and um, they have leaders with a vision. Right. And when I talk about vision, I don't mean, um, oh, let's just build roads or let's, you know, feed the hungry. Those are important. But if you're building roads for 200 million people today, uh, for a nation that its population might double in another three decades, it means that, you know, 20 years from now, you have created another problem because you still have overpopulation, right? But people who can look into the future, tap into data, tap into our history and say, okay, in order for us to succeed for our generation and for posterity, this is the outlook that we need to take in, in, in solving our problems, right? And we don't have that, right? Like I said, you know, I always talk about young people in leadership. There are all the people who have the right mindset. Like, just like I said previously, I would support Pito B <clears throat> um, because not only does he have the experience, he was a former governor, not only has he run successful businesses, Right. There's the empathy there. And there is that vision that captures the importance of posterity. And that's important to me. Right. Um, I want my children to have a better world than I than I have today. And it's important that I do everything that I can to make sure that that happens. Uh, so the main problem we have in Nigeria is having is, is not having leaders who understand a vision that can carry the nation beyond now, one, and then leaders that understand the importance of empathy in leadership, right? Um, you, We have a Congress that is buying cars for itself, uh, for themselves. You know, you have a president who is doing whatever. We already talked about some of those expenditures. Meanwhile, there are people who, Nigeria has about, if not still, the largest population of people who live in extreme poverty. What are you doing to solve that problem? What are you doing to lift people up out of poverty into you know, economic situations that can help them put food on the table, not just for themselves, but also for the people who depend on them? Um, and those are, those are the things that we are not seeing. It's like we have tone deaf leaders who don't care about the masses when the two basic responsibilities of governance is to provide and to protect the people or create the environment that enables them to do that safely you know and um as that yet we're yet to see that well the people of burkina faso mali niger and even gabon were complaining about the same things and then we saw young military leaders taking over and overthrowing these governments, do you think their actions were worth it? Okay, so Francophone Africa has a, a rich history that the rest of Africa has not actually um, adequately delved into, and partly because our educational system, uh, especially I can speak of Nigeria, um, does not prioritize history. 
of the country, not to talk of the continent, right? Um, as a Nigerian, I can say, based on what I know about my country, based on what I know, the people I know in the country are going through, um, what solutions I think is best for Nigerians. Um, for the countries you have mentioned, um, that was a solution they thought was viable to correct the ills of the prior administrations, and they went ahead and did it. I cannot judge in either way to say, oh, that was wrong. No, I, I do not live there to say, you know, um, this was wrong because you, you get what I mean, right? Um, I applaud the, the audacity, right? The boldness, the confidence um, to find a solution to their current problems. Now, was it the right solution? That's for them to decide. Right. And if under the military administration, they are thriving better than they were under democratic or prior administrations, who am I to say anything against it? So in other words, kudos to people who found solutions to their problems. That's quite interesting. And then the solutions to Nigeria's problems is changing the government to who or for who? Who is going to take over? who will be the right person because everybody has a plan, everybody has a vision. However, is implementation that we've seen, uh, I mean, come come up short. So what's, what could happen? Is it a miracle that could create a change in the country? <laughs> okay, so Nigeria is a very peculiar place, I would say. <laughs> I would say. Um, and I say that because, uh, you know, we have a people who, as much as we say we do not trust our institutions, I think sometimes we overtrust them, right? Um, after the elections, we were hoping the judiciary would do what was right, according to the people, right? Or at least, um, you know, uh, be fair in, in, their, <laughs> in their duties. Um, that did not happen. Um, now, do I think a military coup is what Nigeria needs? No, mm -hmm. uh, we've been there before, right? Um, we need the right leaders, right? The, there are, there's a good amount of Nigerians in diaspora. There are many others who are looking to Jabba as well, <laughs> you know, um, I think that, there are ways that we could have impact. Um, there are ways that we could work with what we have right now um, to start to correct some of the ills in the country. Um, but also there is a level of responsibility on our people to speak up about their conditions. There is absolutely no reason why someone you voted for into Congress or into power um, should, you know, embezzle funds necessary for the upkeep and for the development of our people. And instead of speaking up against it, you know, people are looking for the handouts they can get from it, right? That's part of the problem. If we understand the power we have as the masses, how do you recall politicians who are not effective, right? You, there are so many things that we could do that we're not doing, right, as yet, before you start to talk about, you know, whatever, violent, anything. I'm not a huge proponent of, you know, violence as a way to do stuff. Um, so leveraging some of the um, constitutional rights that we have um, and organizing in ways that can allow us to do that effectively is important. And then some people will yeah. say, well, if you want to go that route, you still have the, the obstacle called the judiciary who can still turn things upside mm -hmm. down. Um, yeah. it, it takes a while, but little by little, you know, you, you do start to see progress. So you believe um, in strengthening accountability the is important. That's what I would say. Sorry? You believe in strengthening the systems. So, uh, I mean, there could be fairness, accountability, and all of that. But 
for you, when you were 35, you had a vision, you had a strategy, you had a plan and everything. I can't let you go without asking me this question. How much did it cost you when it comes to, I mean, the money you spent in your campaign and the whole process of becoming president? How much did it cost you? Because I'm sure there are a number of young people who are planning to also create, I mean, a diasporan uh, party so they could come in in the next election to bring or bring the solutions to Nigeria. Can you give us that uh, little piece of information? So, the truth is 2019 is not 2023. 2027 will not be 2023 mm. and so on and so forth. So saying how much it costs me is not going to help anybody, right? As opposed to saying what's important in how to prepare for that, right? Um, organizing is important. You know, having the right ideology that can pull people into your vision um, that are willing to support, right? So I I probably spend the least amount of money um, of all the candidates in that election, partly because we had people who were spending their own money to do things, mm -hmm. right? Um, we had young people who were organizing, um, like in the North, for instance, uh, we had a, a group of young people in Kano who pulled other young leaders from 11 Northern states to come meet with me in Kano. And they spent their own money galvanizing and campaigning in their states, right? Um, there were people who printed books, who printed posters, who printed banners, you know, of their own um, accord, right? Um, so it's not about how much it costs. It's, do you have the right vision? Do you have the right people? And how are you able to communicate that vision so that it brings other people on board? Um, okay. So, and, and course, with your, getting the right people yeah, sorry, yeah. also means finding the right people who can help you fundraise okay. um, and manage, you know, the financial expenses of running a, uh, running a credible campaign. So, yeah. Okay. So the team is important. And with your experience, how can anyone win an election in Africa? with the current systems in place? Um, okay, so I think one of the lessons we learned, right, part of um, my 2019 experience, or at least one of the um, strategies we had going in was, let's try to avoid, you know, the, the godfathers, godfatherism, right? In fact, I remember my very first interview in Nigeria when I returned uh, was on a show called Your View. And the ladies asked me, they're like, who's your godfather? And, you know, coming with the American mentality, I'm like, you know, the Okadaman on the streets, which is 100 naira. And they laughed. They fell out and laughed. <laughs> uh, by the end of the election, we definitely understood the importance of, you know, godfatherism or sponsors, right? But one of the things we came out of that understanding is making sure that you have people who are sold into your vision, right, of moving the country forward, not people who loan you money such that when you get there, you become indebted to them. And that starts, that repeats a cycle of embezzlement, you know, that affects the welfare of the people, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there were four things I believe we we came up with, if you, I can quickly summarize that. Um, mm. Security is important. Um, of course, finances is important. Media is important, both local and international. And of course, <laughs> having this right sponsors, right? The Godfathers. Now, the fifth one is having your insiders in the electoral commission, because we're still talking about Nigeria here, right? Um, now, of those five things, um, your responsibility as a candidate is media. You should be able to communicate your vision, uh, both locally and internationally, right, to, to woo a people, you know, to come along with you. Um, you should be able to uh, convince uh, your sponsors, godfathers or whatever you call them, to buy into your vision, right? and give them a role in that administration, a role that enhances the welfare of the people, not the other way. Um, I don't want to go into much detail because it would just take us off. Now, when it comes to security apparatus, when it comes to IDAC, um, those are now where you need 
your godfathers who have better access into these institutions um, to take the lead, right? Um, in making sure that, you know, you have the right support system um, within those institutions for your candidacy. Um, of course, there are, we can break these even further down to how it could be effective. But for now, those four or five areas are extremely important. And of That's course, right. you need capital, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. to facilitate most of those. Mm. So what, what do you hope to see for Nigeria in the next, let's say, 15 years? 50 or 15? One five. One five. Um, as much as, you know, we, we're not happy about, you know, the current state of affairs, um, we're hoping that, um, at some point, um, our leaders, it's hope we're hoping, you know, we start to understand the importance of prioritizing the lives and the welfare of the people, right? Nigeria is the largest Black nation in the world. There is absolutely no reason why we cannot be a superpower. Nigerians leave Nigeria and they excel everywhere else. In fact, in the U.S., Nigerians are still the most educated, uh, I think, ethnic group when you break it down that way, right? Um, so it's not that we are, we are incapable of being excellent, of leading. We're not. We just don't have people who understand the importance of building a nation for the benefit of the nation and the continent. Um, okay. So even if we believe that the presidency right now does not see that, whether they have a plan or not, I don't know. I'm hoping that the people that they start to surround themselves with, from the ministers or the appointed or that there are some people with good intentions who understand the importance of posterity and will leverage their positions to start to do good. We need that. I'm hoping that our governors, you know, or those around them will start to see the importance of empowering their states and their people to do good, right? I'm hoping that our elected officials, whether senators or reps, will start to see the importance of empowering their communities and start to do that, right? So, so that even if as a whole, we don't see that change happen immediately, we can start to see pockets of things happening that become bright spots that others can now emulate if they don't have the ability to come up with it themselves. That's my hope. Um, so, blindly hoping that in another 15 years, um, Nigeria will be definitely better than we are or where we are today. Um, hmm. There's, you know, in healthcare, infrastructure and in education, um, just name it, tourism, just name it. Like, I, I, I always talk about the fact that we have schools in the United States. You look at Stanford, you look at Harvard, some of the Ivy League schools, whose endowments are more than our budget. And you're talking about schools that have, you know, what, you know, three, four, five thousand, maybe twenty, even if it's forty thousand people are students, right? With an endowment that is almost equivalent or larger than the budget of a nation of over two hundred million people. Um, South Africa's population is just about a quarter of ours. Yeah, they generate way more electricity than we do, right? So it's not like things cannot be done. There are things that can be done. There are things that can be fixed to uplift the, the, the everyday person, citizen. Uh, but you just need the right people in the right strategic spots to start to do work. Okay. Should we expect a comeback for Chiki Ukaigu? Um... That's a great question, right? Off the top of my head, I can say yes. However, what trumps that yes is, as long as there are credible people whom I can, who have shared visions, shared passion, shared empathy, um, I'm happy to support the right 
people or the right person. It doesn't have to be chike. It could be chike, but it doesn't have to be chike. I am all about how do we move our country, our people, our continent forward. That wraps up another yeah. episode of The Conversation. My name is Ismail Okwe. Thank you for joining us, Chiki Ukaibu. Until next time, goodbye. Thank you, Ishmael. It's been a, it's been a definite pleasure. And uh, I look forward to having further conversations about many other things. It doesn't have to be just about leadership. It could be tech. It could be entrepreneurship. It's, there's a lot of great things happening on the continent that I think is important to also highlight. Um, I look forward to, you know, being able to have some of these conversations. Thanks very much. And I appreciate it.